Charles Vereshmati, he's, the, um, he's a professor at the City University of New York and the head of director of a graduate center who's a little bit similar, which is a little similar to our um, advanced studies center here, but maybe he's um, the better person to explain in two or three sentences what they are doing in New York. Um, very modestly, I call, I call our common project a Kursag Manhattan project. What about this? Yeah. <laughs> Charlie. Okay. Uh, well, you uh, know, Kivanok. And for me, it's your uh, regelt, I suppose, since it's uh, pretty early in the morning. Um, and this is a little bit of a historical uh, event in my professional life because you see I'm dressed up very nicely. But because it's so early, uh, I'm now able uh, under the table to have uh, my gymnasium shorts, my, uh, my gymnasium shorts and my uh, sandals that you're not going to see. But this is the first lecture I've ever given in such a state. So uh, let's see how I do on that. Um, uh, is there a screen to uh, help guide me through this uh, particular uh, presentation? Uh, technical team is the technical team there. I don't see what's uh, on the screen right now, so uh, I guess I can go through my copy and we'll see what happens. Uh, so that first slide uh, is explaining that I'm going to be talking about sustainable infrastructure. Uh, I'm both uh, a scientist uh, and an engineer, and uh, in the world of sustainable development, there's a new idea uh, that's in some sense a, a rediscovered idea that, that's floating within the dialogue. And that's uh, talking about sustainable infrastructure, uh, building towards the sustainable development uh, goals. And there's this uh, idea of being able to uh, take the best of traditional engineering, we call that great engineering, and combine it with green systems or nature-based uh, types of engineering. And I'll explain this as I go forward. Let me also say that this lecture is very much as I would give a lecture to any scientific uh, body, any scientific conference. And I'll do my best uh, to try to explain some of the details. They may look a little bit complicated, but I'll try to distill them in a way that uh, will be intuitive uh, to us all. Uh, next slide, please. Can we advance the slide? Um, this um, somewhat uh, clipped diagram uh, is a reminder to me of the importance of some early thinking. And back in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, there was an ecologist named Howard Odom. Uh, he's, he published quite widely. You can find these uh, documents uh, in any library or in any ar electronic archive. And um, he was in the business of trying to bring together uh, energy dynamics, economics, uh, and ecosystems and try to formalize that. And uh, what he was able to do is he was able to lay out these principles, which uh, as I go back and read th this literature, I, I think are uh, quite uh, appropriate for the discussion of the sustainable uh, development goals. And I'd like to uh, just take a couple of excerpts from a paper he wrote back in 1973. And I think uh, it will immediately be obvious uh, to us all uh, how this might relate to sustainability uh, planning and design and execution in a region, for example, like Pannonia. So let me read these so I don't miss any of the words. Uh, even in urban areas, this is number 11, uh, he laid out 20 I think it was 20 principles. And the 11th principle says that even in urban areas, more than half of the useful work on which our society is based comes from the natural flows of wind, water, waves, etc., that act through the broad areas of seas and landscapes without money payment. An economy to compete and survive must maximize its use of these energies, not destroying their enormous free subsidies. The necessity of environmental inputs is often not realized until they are displaced. Together uh, with this 11th principle is the 12th principle, saying that environmental technology, which duplicates the work available 
from the ecological sector, in other words, from nature, is an economic uh, handicap. So he's really laying out there what you might term the financial logic of good environmental stewardship. And in the intervening years between 1973 and today, uh, those ideas were formalized uh, and become known as ecosystem uh, services. Next slide, please. Um, as a guidepost to this discussion, I'd like to read to you uh, a vision that I and uh, several of my colleagues uh, have crafted. Uh, this is a vision for the year 2030, uh, imagining, as it were, uh, the successful implementation, the successful execution of the sustainable development goals, which are an organizing uh, principle uh, in, in an agreement signed by 193 nation states uh, to develop the world's economy, bring human well being, and protect the environment in a sustainable way. And this is a United Nations initiative. Um, let me read to you this statement, and then as we go through the, the lecture, I'd like to ask you uh, in your own mind silently to be uh, thinking about how reasonable this vision uh, is. So let me give you the ideal uh, world of the future. Let me read this so I don't miss any of the words myself, as I did for the Howard Odom uh, discussion. Uh, the year is 2030 ever accelerating environmental and societal challenges, all operating under the backdrop of climate change and biodiversity loss are today routinely met with novel solutions. These solutions were initiated within the first five years of the sustainable development goals by early investments that stimulated innovation in water provision systems that rely on the conjunctive use of traditional engineering and environmentally based services. I should mention I'm going to be talking about water today because I um, am a water scientist. Next slide, please. This has provided now universal access to clean water and sanitation. Nation states have committed to the broad scale protection of watersheds inland aquatic ecosystems, and the life forms they support. This has been particularly beneficial in blunting growing human pressure on water systems from local to global scales. Next slide. Conserving water, appropriately using wastewater, and managing well-functioning ecosystems today provides enormous cost savings liberating investment capital to address other SDG-related challenges and sustainable economic growth. The benefits of preserving water-related ecosystem services combined with appropriately scaled gray or traditionally engineered infrastructure have been harnessed for reliable water delivery. Next slide, please. Success can be verified by early investments, that is before 2020, in advanced environmental monitoring capabilities using state-of-the-art environmental sensing, data and computer simulation systems, which have replaced fragmentary environmental surveillance systems and guesswork regarding water at the turn of the century. A skilled practitioner workforce is today in place which can rapidly assimilate new knowledge from the water sciences and convert it into practical solutions. Next slide, please. A new economics of water, as well as new governance and regulatory systems have emerged to guarantee the rights of all uh, to adequate supplies of water and their ethical use, leading to improved social equity, gender equality, and sustainable growth. Now, again, this is for the year 2030. It's very much in the spirit of what Howard Odom would have loved to have seen the uh, Earth's environment and uh, energy and economic systems uh, performing as by this time. But I'd like you to consider how feasible this statement really is. This is the aspiration 
of those 193 uh, nation states uh, that signed that agreement uh, under the United Nations uh, umbrella, how feasible and achievable uh, this uh, particular vision is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about solutions and we'll talk about how some of these challenges may be turned into opportunities as I move through my lecture. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you know, the first uh, shock to you, perhaps if you don't know this, uh, the first shock that I'd like to uh, present to you is um, the distribution or the geography, uh, globally that is, uh, of threats that have accumulated to our water systems uh, that now move up to being a global syndrome. And the map on the top here is a, uh, uh, an intuitive picture, as it were, of areas that are under very, very high threat to their inland water systems. That's shown in red. Uh, green and blue show lesser levels of threat. This is a measure of how well we are managing the ambient environment and the water systems upon which we rely uh, for our sustenance as, and as well uh, aquatic biodiversity and nature uh, relies on for a clean and reliable water supply. And as you can see, much of the earth is colored red. Uh, you would expect red to be seen in uh, places like India and China where there perhaps has been less attention to environmental protection. But yet in places like the United States and Europe, we are not doing a very good job of protecting these inland waterways from which we draw our water supplies. The reason that this map is, is shown as it is, is because it represents the conjunction of a series of unintended uh, insults, as it were, to the environmental system, arising from poor land management and, and poor watershed um, stewardship, from pollution, from the overuse and maladaptive management of water, and biotic stress agents like the introduction, the inadvertent introduction of exotic species that disrupt ecosystems. Uh, our conclusion is that uh, wherever you have development or rapidly developing areas of the globe, uh, there's very little evidence of good stewardship, even in rich countries where we know how to do a better job, but we elect to do things differently. So what we evidently do, as we've discovered, uh, is shown in this next slide. Uh, could, could I please have that next slide? Uh, these four maps uh, are uh, organized in sequence here. And what we've done is we've created a map of the source areas for human water supply. That's shown in the top left. And it shows the amount of water uh, that's available in terms of the populations uh, served. Uh, this blue map is sort of the baseline set of colors. Uh, now, if you were to have no environmental services along the lines of what Howard Odom is, was talking about in that second slide that I showed, you would see an earth that would have not only red, blue, and green colors, but black colors, uh, extremely threatened ecosystems. And the mere fact that we have natural systems, nature-based uh, environments uh, that are working for us silently and in the background, we avoid the situation that you see on the top right, which is the potential or the virtual threat. And because of the protected, protective functions of natural ecosystems, what we do see is that threat on the bottom right, which is identical to what I showed you in the last slide. That's what we see in the ambient environment. Now, humans draw from this resource. And as we know, we don't, in Europe at least, and in the United States, live in an area where we have a perception at least that these water systems are so threatened because we engineer our way out of this threat. We create large-scale engineering facilities that treat 
the water if it's unfit for consumption. We stabilize the water in large reservoir and dam systems if they are uh, too variable and we need to store them for later use, uh, et cetera. And that cost about $750 billion a year. It's about three quarters of a trillion dollars to repair, as it were, the damage that we see uh, in using traditional engineering. And as you can see, we're almost, at least in places like Europe and the United States, uh, we're almost back to where we were when we started at the top, uh, top left. So the, the bottom left is the residual threat that we see. And please notice that much of the South, the developing world, is left with some residual threat in terms of their delivery of water services to humankind. Okay, so this is the new way in which uh, we are now beginning to conceptualize how humans are treating their water systems. And this is emblematic of how they treat other environmental uh, services as well. We impair the system, we break the system, and then we fix it, we repair it. We impair and we repair the system. Uh, and now I'd like to discuss some ways in which we might uh, look to some other resources to help us move through uh, this challenge area. And again, this is $750 billion a year to remediate or to fix the observed threat. Next slide, please. In the future, uh, and in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, we're going to see potentially a great success story for Sustainable Development Goal number one, which is the alleviation of severe poverty. And these curves that you see on the top right are distributions of annual per capita income uh, with the vertical axis here being the millions of people exposed to those incomes. And if you follow the blue curve to the green curve to the uh, 2050 curve in red, over a 50 year period, you see this shift and you see the shift in wealth. And there is a very rapid rise in something called the global middle class. And the global middle class will bring with it economic development and economic well-being to literally billions of people. So it's a success story for the sustainable development goals. But if we do business as we have done business as in the past, as those last two slides I have shown you, if you can please advance the slide, please. Please hit the button. Uh, what you see is that we have more in the map. We have more of the same by mid-century. And for different parts of the globe, we have very rapid rise in the levels of threat, meaning that it's going to become ever, ever more difficult for us to cope with this increasing threat and make water systems uh, of utility to humankind. And the price tag of this is bound to go up. May I please have the next slide? So how might we tackle this issue? Uh, and uh, in the 7th of August 2015 issue in Science Magazine, and it's so fairly easy to get hold of. I, I suggest you, you try to take a look at this uh, article. There was a little bit of a debate uh, on the pages of science uh, looking at how uh, you might uh, execute during the sustainable development goal period uh, water security. Would you rely on traditional gray infrastructure shown on the left or would you uh, perhaps look at nature-based solutions? Uh, again, going back to that idea that, that Howard Odom planted back in the early 1970s. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that there's a debate about this means that there's still some unresolved issues uh, within the community. Uh, if you hit the next uh, advance, I'd like to uh, show you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about in terms of uh, engineered or gray infrastructure. So please hit the button. Please advance the slide. Uh, the kinds of things that we're talking about are large reservoir systems, centralized uh, water treatment facilities, 
uh, interbasin transfers that move water from water rich areas to water scarce areas where humans demand the water, large scale irrigation works, things of this nature. Uh, this takes a lot of money, as I mentioned, $750 billion a year in this kind of engineering today. And uh, if you hit the advanced button, please, you'll see on the right side uh, what we can call nature-based solutions, where you use intact forest, intact floodplains, uh, you uh, uh, treat ecosystems as though they have economic value and they can provide functional services for us. For example, wetlands uh, are, uh, are able to clean uh, water pollution from waterways and they perform in that sense an environmental service, a free and uncompensated for environmental service. So the way we might begin looking at the future is how do we combine these two kinds of systems? Next slide, please. Now, one might always think that we're doing a fantastic job in terms of our use of engineered infrastructure. I'm in a civil engineering department and we're very proud of the kinds of facilities and infrastructure that we as civil engineers uh, build. But simply building these systems on the one hand uh, and on the other hand, not really paying sufficient attention to their uh, planning and maintenance. Uh, we find that when we analyze the state of affairs with respect to this infrastructure, we might find some surprises. And every two or three years, the American Society of Civil Engineers develops an infrastructure report card. And the infrastructure report card for 2017 looks at all sorts of infrastructure. Uh, but for the infrastructure that's associated with water systems, and if you could hit the advance button for me, please. We go forward. Uh, you will see these grades, and uh, this is uh, a reflection of the U.S. grading system for students, uh, with A and A plus being superb, superlative, superb performance, excellent performance, going down to A, B, C is average, D is near failing, and F is failure. Well, as you can see, for these grades, uh, in terms of reservoirs, drinking water, navigation, uh, uh, wastewater uh, treatment, uh, flood protection, uh, we see that in the United States, we're getting nearly fairly failing grades for these kinds of infrastructure. We're not paying sufficient attention to its maintenance and upgrade. And you can imagine if we're having problems in a place like the United States, a rich country, Imagine what this must be like in places like Africa, where I can assure you that the infrastructure is in severe disrepair. This is the traditionally engineered gray infrastructure. Next slide, please. Well, let's take a look at how green infrastructure might be used. And I use as an example here, a very interesting paper that appeared uh, about two years ago in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. I was not part of this team, uh, but I, I can report very proudly that there were several water scientists that I know who contributed to the thinking. Uh, what this shows is a survey of more than 300 uh, river systems uh, of the, the planet uh, and the cities that are served by the contributing uh, watersheds. And there's a, a map there uh, showing a place in China and you see the watershed in the city and in New York, uh, we have watersheds that are displaced and far away from the city and with large piping systems, we deliver it to our drinking uh, water supply system and pipes in the city. Uh, this analysis of more than 300 cities uh, revealed some very interesting results. Now, you would expect in these landscapes and watersheds that serve drinking water supplies for these 300 cities, 
these would be the most well-protected environmental assets, environmental landscapes that you can imagine on the planet. Because in fact, there is drinking water supplies for hundreds and hundreds of millions of people at stake if you don't protect the watershed. Next slide, please. Hit the button again. Very surprisingly, I might say shockingly, when they looked at these watersheds, they discovered over a century time frame, and that's shown on the left side of this diagram, uh, we see the very rapid uh, increase in population within these watersheds. We see the expansion of croplands and rangelands for grazing on the top right, uh, top left. On the bottom left, we see nutrient pollution loads and pollution loads from sediments rising very, very quickly. We see on the top right, large increases in the sediment fluxes of these systems. Uh, and ultimately, when they analyzed these 300 river systems and their cities, they found that about 50% of these were either moderately to or severely threatened. Next, advance, please. Now, this is more than of academic interest. This has a very practical result. And as you might expect, and 100% in keeping with Howard Odom's statement back in 1973, these systems, when abused, are an economic hardship. And when you then have to rehabilitate these water systems and make the water suitable for human consumption, the capital costs and the operational costs increase very, very dramatically. It's much more expensive to do business now when these systems are broken and impaired, just as I showed with those global maps. Next slide, please. One might also say, well, we have all of these protected areas uh, across the planet. And, uh, you know, yes, we do. Uh, and protected areas of the planet uh, generate about 20% of all of the world's global runoff. Uh, and about two thirds of the world's population lives downstream of these protected areas. So we have in some sense uh, a situation in which we could look potentially to protected areas to help achieve this goal of human water security. But the problem is, as shown in the top map, uh, there's a lot of red in that map. And these protected areas uh, have 80% of the people who are in fact served, are served by waters in protected areas that are drawn from high levels of threat, even in protected areas. And one might ask, why is this possibly the, the case? And the reason is that we're not investing sufficient money in protecting these ecosystems. And in fact, we're spending about 10 to $20 billion per year globally in protected areas. It's been estimated that each year you need about 50 to $80 billion a year. So there's a fourfold or fivefold shortfall in these investments that must be made. And I would like everyone to compare this to the $750 billion for the gray engineering, which fixes the problem that's uh, presented to us in the first place. And the whole idea here is that if you protected the system, you would probably not have to be spending $750 billion a year to repair the damage using engineered systems. This is a very key point as we begin to design ways of moving through the SDG era. May I have the next slide, please? Um, one can begin to take a look at how you would engineer both gray infrastructure and green infrastructure together, kind of a 
a blended engineering, as, as we might call it. And um, you can look here for doing this for clean drinking water supply or for water quality and pollution control. And you have different, uh, as it were, uh, uh, engineering levers to pull. And if you're thinking of, of uh, uh, drinking water for cities, uh, green infrastructure, green engineering would mean uh, increasing the areas for uh, watershed protection, making sure that uh, the landscapes right near river systems are, are protected. Uh, you might uh, institute uh, reforestation uh, campaigns where there's been uh, deforestation and lots of, uh, uh, lots of excess flood runoff or lots of sediments or lots of pollutants coming off of these uh, systems. Uh, if you were to pull the, the gray engineering or the traditional engineering le lever, you would modernize drinking water uh, facilities. You would increase the levels of treatment uh, for wastewater uh, because after all, uh, sewers uh, deliver wastewater to rivers and those rivers, if the wastewater is not sufficiently treated, becomes the drinking water of populations downstream. So you want to avoid that, that problem. Uh, so, so anyway, there are these different kinds of, of uh, uh, strategies that you might use to blend the green uh, and, and the gray. These uh, are very uh, uh, responsive to the sixth uh, sustainable development goal signed by the United Nations uh, uh, signatories uh, for clean drinking water, sanitation, pollution, and ecosystem protection. So you get all of these co-benefits. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, I uh, led a group of uh, about 15 to 20 of, uh, of my colleagues, uh, and we were asked by something called the High Level Panel on Water. This was convened by the United Nations uh, and the World Bank, and it uh, uh, involved 10 heads of state who had a keen interest in water and water system sustainability. And I am proud to say that President Otter from Hungary was a member of that high level panel. And uh, our team was, uh, was asked uh, to present a white paper on how you might use environmental services to better uh, analyze, first of all, um, the state of affairs with respect to water and execute sustainable thinking in terms of water provision services for humankind, which very much would be based on environmental services together with traditional engineering. And I show these set of balloons, as it were, uh, on a XY plot. Uh, we have a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, I show levels of green infrastructure from very low levels to very high levels. And the pictures underneath show you what we're talking about. On the vertical axis, which is showing the traditional engineering, there are some iconic images which you've already seen. Uh, we have low levels of service uh, down at the bottom of that vertical axis. And we have advanced service at the top. And you have these different balloons. And each of the colors is linked from a number one to a number two. Number one indicating year 2015 and number two indicating year 2030, the era of the sustainable development goals. If you hit the advance button, I'm going to circle one pair of balloons, A1, A2. This represents a place like uh, Kabul, Afghanistan. And the idea is that they have very insufficient levels of engineering today. They cannot really rely much on green infrastructure uh, today. And in the 15 years of the Sustainable Development Goal era, we can try to push this balloon uh, up and toward the right. And the most far top and right is the ideal for all systems. But unfortunately for Kabul, Afghanistan, they may be lucky if they get basic services from traditional engineering, and they may use to some 
slightly higher degree green infrastructure, if they're lucky, they're going to fall far short of that top right box, which is the ideal combination of the two modalities. Hit the advance button uh, twice, please. The second example I would like to use is for Kampala, Uganda, which is already using some of its green infrastructure to bring a sufficient water supply to its citizens. And the idea is over the next 15 years, they should target advancing their traditionally engineered system to go from B1 to B2. Hit the button twice, please. Last example, one more time, is for New York City, where we already have advanced service and we can do a better job of utilizing our green infrastructure. And it came as a surprise to me, a shock to me, is because of the residual pollution and uh, lack of 100% effective land management in that watershed or those watersheds that serve the New York City water supply. There's a need for over 100 treatment facilities uh, coming off of those uh, watersheds. So we can certainly do uh, a better job of protecting those ecosystems. Next, please. Um, in order for all this to, to really take root, uh, I think it's going to be uh, absolutely necessary to identify new business models to engage the private sector. I think a lot of what I've shown to you today is probably in some sense a, a failure, uh, it, it indicates a failure of governments or international bodies to really regulate the state of affairs with respect to our uh, environment. And I think it's now time to turn to a positive and uh, mutually beneficial partnership uh, with the private sector. Uh, again, I, I published a paper uh, uh, in Science, it's in the uh, 2nd of February 2018 issue, uh, where I, I joined forces with some of my academic colleagues, but also uh, asset managers from the UBS Bank uh, and from PGGM, which is a uh, pension fund in the Netherlands. And we wrote a paper about the need for uh, science to provide the appropriate information sets and cues and signals through transparent, traceable, and reliable metrics of investments that the private sector and asset holders could make to uh, provide support for sustainability thinking. And for those of you who are interested, again, I think it'd be easy to get hold of this particular uh, document. If, uh, if not, you can contact the conference organizers and I'll make this uh, paper available to anyone who's interested uh, in it. But I think in the sustainable development era, we have to be thinking about different ways of approaching the problem in the first place. And as an example, this blending of green and gray infrastructure is one very important new way of doing business, but also quite literally a new way of doing business with the private sector and engaging them in this debate is absolutely essential. Next slide, please. Uh, in fact, to make this attractive to the business community, uh, my group at the City University of New York is beginning to develop a set of technologies that would allow the private sector to view opportunities for investing. And again, this is in, in uh, terms of water security and water infrastructure. Uh, and we develop uh, what's shown here as a fairly simple initial calculation procedure, where on the top left, we can produce a global map. And again, if you're an investor, you might be very interested in looking for areas where there are water problems and where there are opportunities for me to sell my products. And wherever the, the coloration is blue or green, you have a pretty good opportunity to go in there and sell your products because there's a need. That's the top left-hand diagram. Uh, lower opportunities would be shown in red. Well, in fact, lower opportunities are shown in the middle diagram. 
So you take these investment opp opportunities and you subtract from them these investment challenges as shown in the top middle. And you can see there are areas that, of the planet that show up as very, very dark red. These uh, uh, are associated with systems that have poor regulatory mechanisms. They may be involved in conflict uh, areas. They're fragile states to begin with, and there's very, very poor governance and uh, business security as it were. So you might wanna look at this map in a very different, the original map in a different way, a way that says, well, there are challenges here to actually going in and selling our products. Furthermore, if you want to do good, you want to um, uh, make sure that your products are not creating any negative impacts on the environment. Uh, for example, putting large reservoir systems in uh, very sensitive river systems can destroy biodiversity, and you don't want to do that if you're a company wishes to get credit for sustainable investing. So on the top right, there are maps that can be developed showing the negative impact of investments uh, on nature. So when you put all of this together, you get the larger map at the bottom. And you have a very uh, different set of perspectives when you look at what the challenges there are and what the negative impacts are of doing business the old fashioned way, as I would say. We think that this is a very appropriate way to engage the community. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is um, my final slide with diagrams on it. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, the scientific community has begun to document something called the Great Acceleration. And these uh, multiple uh, plots on the right uh, show a 250 year time period. And you could see that uh, somewhere around 1930, 1950 or so, we see something called the Great Acceleration, where there's a very uh, important rise in the uh, uh, types of activities that humans are uh, engaged in. And this is at the global scale. We have population rising very rapidly. We have the damming of river systems, we have transport vehicles uh, rapidly rising, the rise of the global economy, water use goes up, paper consumption, telecommunication, uh, international tourism, and even McDonald's restaurants, all going up very, very rapidly, very exponentially. And that's all well and good for human well-being. It may not be so good for the planet. In terms of water, at the same time that all of these systems are very rapidly accelerating, we see on the bottom left that the monitoring of flow systems at the global scale is in severe decline, and the use of water or the reporting of the uses of water in the designated uh, archives that the United Nations has set up in both cases are going down. And I know better what was happening 10 or 15 or 20 years ago than I do today. And if you hit the button, in the context of this forward, the context of this great acceleration, it's like putting on a blindfold as you're stepping on the acceleration pedal of the vehicle and really not knowing where you're going. And to me, it's quite amazing that we've not invested in these monitoring systems. And again, uh, Governments have not done a great job. Perhaps the private sector will help us to revitalize this very, very important resource in terms of understanding where we have been, where we are, and where we're going. Next slide, please. So this is my concluding slide, and then I'm going to switch gears uh, uh, and talk a little bit about how this relates to Pannonia. Uh, so there's substantial financial losses from these uh, impaired ecosystems. Uh, I've shown you lots of evidence, I think, for that. Uh, at the same time, if we want to do something about these problems, uh, I think we can find that there are opportunities to begin uh, to bring together gray infrastructure, traditional engineering, and these nature-based uh, solutions. I think this has to be executed at the regional scale, and perhaps Pannonia can be a, a poster child for instituting this kind of thinking in a creative way. And then uh, uh, finally, uh, the key is going to be to create and incentivize business models. 
that emphasize these very solutions that we're talking about. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's some contact information. I'd like to rapidly move to the next set, small set of slides as I talk a little bit about Pannonia. But I would like to simply say uh, that there's some contact information here. We can make this presentation available to the conference uh, participants. And on the bottom right, I make an announcement that with the OECD and the UN World Water Assessment Program and a group called Water Future, um, uh, academic uh, uh, organization that's international in its sp uh, scope, we're forming a working group to uh, better articulate these ideas. And we're always looking for uh, willing partners to participate with us in that effort. Again, let's make this uh, uh, slide and the rest of the talk available to the participants. I'd like to move rapidly to the next uh, small set of slides. Um, thank you very much. This is um, this a very, very substantial contribution. But, but for our audience, um, who were not here four years, two years ago when you um, Andras Solosi and Janos Bogardi and many other colleagues uh, had an interesting workshop in our, um, in our premises in the Europe House. And then we met first and telling you about our Creative Cities concept. We started to work on a joint project which is slowly um, getting um, realized. So the connection between um, your research and our research is that we not only here in Köseg and in, at IAS, and not only interested in um, beautifying an old, beautiful, but a rundown city, or, or looking for cultural heritage, or remodeling old buildings, or doing interesting research on philosophy and history and, and, and poetry, which is, you know, music is very important in order to reinforce the identity of old historic cities like Köseg, Sopron, Veszprém, etc. But also interested in the connection between the hard factors, yeah, like economic sustainability and ecological sustainability, and on the other hand, cultural heritage type of sustainability, how to make societies sustainable, how to convince people um, to stay where they are and to contribute um, to the city, and as environmental sustainability. So this is the kind of link which will be elaborated during the conference. I'm not going to talk about this. Um, but a small project grew out of this that was initiated by, by Professor um, uh, Vörösmarty, and we had a discussion, and we invited Professor Hilary Brown, who actually made the skits, a kind of a a sketch about how to create Kursag and it's sustainable from an economic point of view. And this is a very interesting point, how to make a connection between global issues, water supply, ecological problems, and very, very local problems. Okay? Charlie is back. Um, so again, I showed you global maps, uh, which uh, are in some sense a uh, an important ingredient of our thinking because what it does is it, it, it paints the overall picture and it enables a context to be developed for any area of the globe we wish to focus in on. So now instead of looking globally uh, at um, uh, tens of thousands of kilometers of, of, of uh, uh, linear uh, space, we're now looking at maybe 40 or 50 kilometers of linear space as we look at uh, Pannonia and some of its connection to uh, Austria and uh, the drainage basins in terms of water uh, that feed into the system and define its character. So this is just a recalibration of our perspective. We're now looking at a very, very much smaller area. However, I think that there are important lessons to be learned from the global analysis that can be brought to bear uh, on this particular uh, uh, region. Uh, so uh, let me quickly go through these slides. You're gonna hear about this more. Uh, you, you may see these slides again, uh, but I think it's important uh, in terms of the concepts that have to be played out. 
Next slide, please. One of the important things is to have an appropriate uh, framework. And Hillary Brown uh, is a great proponent of something called the circular economy, where you take flows of uh, energy, flows of material, uh, flows of uh, human uh, capital uh, and human activities, and you begin to close the loop so that you're not always uh, having to rely on external subsidies, for example, for your entire uh, energy supply, where you have to import oil from, for example, the Middle East. There may be local resources to do this. Uh, and this, this I iconic image here shows how you take ecosystem services on the left and a regional uh, complex of hard infrastructure, uh, people resources, and you can begin to blend these, taking waste streams and converting them in appropriate ways uh, through goods and services uh, and doing this in an innovative way. And we've come up with this concept of creating centers for eco-innovation. Eco and the, the conference will dive into this in much greater detail. This um, larger set of blue, di uh, blue arrows here uh, just remind us that this is not done in the context simply of engineering and, and let's say natural systems. You have to have good governments, you have to have good community involvement, and you have to have good business models, as I mentioned before, to really drive this whole schema. Next slide, please. This is a much more detailed accounting of what that circular economy might look like. It's a, a further articulation of what could be done in a place like Kurseg or maybe Sombate or Vesprame, uh, but it's a worked example, as it were, of what you can do. And there are all sorts of local resources uh, that can be put to work to circularize that economy, make it more efficient, reduce the costs of external subsidies and produce potential export markets for the products that can be produced in this region. Next slide, please. So it's important to have a framework. Next slide. It's important also to have a vision and to have visionaries. And the group that we assembled, which really, in my view, uh, was uh, among the best uh, collection of advanced students from both my institution, but also from Hungarian institutions, uh, and to watch these students work together and create a vision, and a vision created in large measure by these young people who are going to be living the vision uh, is, is really quite something. And you know, I read you my vision statement uh, at the beginning of my first talk, but this in some sense is a visualization of a more localized vision of what something uh, uh, like, like this facility envisioned for Kusek could really be about. And the students have these visioning processes. So this is just one of the, uh, uh, one of the starting uh, points. The next slide shows how this might be converted into something a little bit different with eco inc incubators and uh, gastro enterprise, as we might uh, call it, farmer's market, aquaponic greenhouses. And this will be explained later as the the conference goes along, uh, and, and really con beginning to convert the old infrastructure into a new kind of infrastructure. Next statement, uh, next uh, uh, slide, please. And uh, yeah, the idea is to take what has been there and to really envision what the future might look like. And to the credit of the students, they came up with a very interesting set of uh, opportunities uh, for investments in these new sustainably based uh, business models. And I think that this, is a, uh, this could, again, be a real uh, uh, gem stone in the, the idea of sustainable development. And I think a place like Pannonia could be featured as a, as a success story and to be featured globally in this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are all sorts of uh, opportunities 
There are all sorts of activities which could be uh, created around this eco hub or this eco innovation center. And as another principle, uh, the idea of creating educational opportunities for urban planners, for city managers, for next generation of engineers, for technologists, for landscape managers, for water system scientists. Uh, that's really important because it's not going to be executed by people uh, like me with my gray hair. Uh, and it's going to be executed by young people. And uh, the idea of blending a very, very strong educational component into this center is absolutely critical. Next statement, please. And finally, um, this is my last slide. Uh, this is not going to be executed uh, alone. It's not an academic exercise. It really has to take uh, root in very practical sense. And it's a partnership, really. It's a partnership of public sector, academia, NGOs and civil society, and also the private sector. And I think without that consortium, without that partnership, uh, these concepts, whether it's executed in Kuseg or some other place in Pannonia or some other region of the globe, it really has to be built on these partnerships in order to move forward. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time uh, and your attention. And I hope that uh, the global now meets the local uh, set of perspectives. And if we have a little bit of time, I'm happy to take some questions. And I'll be on the line uh, as necessary uh, uh, for however you need me here. Thank you.